In my time as a gunsmith, I've noted something about triggers. They come in four varieties. They either break like glass, they break like ice, they break like a carrot, or they break like a Mosin. Yeah, let's talk about triggers here. I want to talk a few basic things about angles, uh, pressure areas, things like that, and how to recognize the trigger when you see it and what it should look like and what it shouldn't look like. Let's go, rabbit hole time. This is probably the simplest trigger ever. You have a trigger, which is actually the sear, which is the part that's going to trap the energy. And then you have a hammer, which is the part that we're going to trap. There's three components to this thing. You've got the pivot pin for the hammer. You've got the pivot pin for the trigger. And then you've got the spot where the two meet. So here we've got a line coming up through here got a line coming up through here and this whole mess is a triangle okay so this is the sear this is the hammer right and here's where they meet all right so we're gonna call this point number one and point number two in everything we look at in this video point number one is gonna be the pivot pin on the sear point number two is gonna be the pivot pin on the hammer now the hammer does not have to rotate the hammer can slide in a linear format i want you to remember that but at the end of the day we're going to now we're going to break out number one and we're going to bring number one out here and we're going to know that number one swings through an arc this has to be 90 degrees no matter what the sear has the nose of the sear has to be stoned on a tangent all right has to be now i'm going to get a lot of blowback from a lot of people comment in this video that it doesn't have to be there you can set up whatever you want to set up but in the drawings for the 1911 the patent drawings it calls this out as a 90. it calls it out everywhere i've ever seen the part that is trapping the energy has to be at 90 degrees all right well, we know that 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3, has to equal 180. So if you know that this is 90, if you know this angle, you can determine what's left over here. Point number 1, point number 2, where they need is point number 3. In this case, that wants to rotate that way, but what if this just wants to move this way? These angles still matter. This still has to be 90 degrees. This has to be 90. And when you pull this out of the way, it will drop and move that way. So that would be a, a, a striker, a horizontal sear on a gun. Horizontal sears are kind of a weird case. Here's a, here's a lock that has a horizontal sear on it. And as we cock it, You'll watch that fall through the lock plate. See that fall through? It went through that way, right? So when this slides out this way, it will allow this piece to come around. Now, does it matter if the piece is coming around or sliding? No, it does not. It's relative motion between the two. This happens to be a lock that was made a long time ago. All right? So this force setup, I want you to remember this. Point one, point two, and point three that has to be 90 degrees right there, 90 degrees, and this is what's left over. So you can move this pivot point in, out, around, but you're always gonna have the thing you're trapping with, the thing that's being trapped, and where they touch each other. Clear as mud. Let me show you a couple of examples. As an illustration of the basic one, two, three setup, Here's a Peabody rifle. Here it is. Here's, there's one for the sear pivot, two for the tumbler pivot, and then three is where they meet. Simple enough. In this particular case, 
that the uh, tumbler wants to rotate counterclockwise and we're attempting to intercept that. The nose of this sear should be cut at 90 degrees to the pin and whatever angle is left over to make up 180 degrees is what the, was what the tumbler notch is, cu is cut at because they do not meet at an exact 90 degree angle, although it's pretty close in this setup. Now, let's talk about that Nagant and talk about a sliding uh, striker, okay? The Nagant is a very simple setup. The sear and the sear spring are the same part, and all of this has to intercept this lug sticking down out of the bolt um, so there's a lot of loosey-goosiness that has to be taken care of in here and all this gets jammed together and the nose of the sear and the ledge which would be in our particular case meeting point number three are here and they slide in and out and it's not the world's cleanest trigger it is simple it is extremely easy to fabricate and it is relatively uh, I was going to say sailor proof, but soldier proof at the end of the day. And this thing did a lot of good work for a lot of long time. So just don't complain about your Nagant Seer. Understand what it was and why it was what it was. But here we have a case where instead of the contact point rotating, the contact point is sliding. The metal in a trigger is there for a very good reason. And if you remove any of it, you better damn well know what you're doing. The amount of, of force that a piece of metal can absorb is not infinite. So the pressure that you can exert on a piece of steel that we're calling a sear or we're calling a, a, a tumbler, a hammer, whatever, is not infinite. There has to be some area and the more metal you remove from one of these triggers and the smaller you make the area the higher the pressure gets. Pressure is force over area. So for a given amount of force, meaning mainspring pressure, whichever pushing these two together, you're going to get to a point, if you make the area small enough, this pressure will fundamentally go to infinity. Your, your trigger components will fail, your weight will fail, and eventually you'll either get an alibi, you'll hurt somebody, or any one of a number of negative outcomes i recommend you don't go there just remember that metal that was put in the trigger in the first place is supposed to be there if you're going to do a trigger job work on things that cause friction so get rid of all the friction before you ever touch the mating surfaces number three is the last thing you touch with a stone smith and wesson new century the triple lock the apex of revolver design and yet, we have to pull this out of the way here and cut this back. Here we have pivot number one, pivot number two, and here's number three where, the, where they uh, interface. This particular trigger, there is, there is no control of over travel. There's no control of creep. So it'll creep, and it'll let go, then it'll over travel. But it's so imperceptible in this gun, it's pretty hard to find out um however we have that we have that number three sliding interface here that's your 90 degree pivot angle there and then this is what's left over same thing in double action by the way except you're pushing up on this double action paul right here let me get that out of the way all right and the trigger is pushing up on that and it's sliding and right now what we have is we have one two and three but three is a sliding interface and when that lets go that comes down behind it and sets back up for another one however they're all here now on the on the topic of adjustability the winchester model 70 trigger we're going to look at this here all right the engagement okay so number one this is the number one pivot right here now, in this particular case, the sear is the trigger. We use these words interchangeably, sear, trigger. This is technically a sear with a finger loop on it. Technically, even though we call it a trigger because we touched the trigger. So the engagement on this is set by how this angle is stoned. And the way this thing looks, 
and there's a half turn in it and then it comes up high like this so that's what you're seeing right here is this is lower than this by about 20 thousandths of an inch and then the reason for this is is that it is impossible to get a clean inside angle you cannot stone this or even cut it to a tight angle what you do is you cut a shape out like that so now you have a virtual corner and the virtual corner is right here if you see what i'm talking about so then this piece sits in there like that right so that's the engagement is this distance uh, on the number three um, component then back here on number one you have two things this is allowed to rotate this way until this piece here contacts the frame so by setting how far in and out this plunger is you can set how far this can rotate and optimally you would like it to stop rotating as soon as it clears and that piece falls out of the way so this is the over travel adjustment and then these two locking nuts here you unlock them and you run you run this nut up and down this stud to control the compression of this spring and that's that's weight so here you have engagement or creep how far do you have to move it before it breaks over travel how far will it move after it breaks and weight which is how hard you have to pull on it to make it creep those are the three things so this is a winchester model 70 and the smith and wesson triple log here's a trigger you've seen before this is the ar-15 m16 trigger it uh it has a position one a position two and a position three it's got two position threes all right wait a minute this is a trigger out of an a5 this trigger looks suspiciously like our m16 trigger wait a minute here's a garand this trigger looks exactly like the one out of the A5, which looks exactly like the one on the M16. All of them have a one, two, three point here. Uh, you see the point I'm trying to get across is, is the machine it's in is immaterial. Triggers are a relatively simple thing when you look at them that way. And once you see it, it's hard to unsee. And you set all three of these triggers up in three different guns from three different parts of the planet up the same way. That's the whole point. Triggers are a relatively simple thing, and yet people tend to complicate this into oblivion, and I don't know why. Be you know, some triggers do suck, and before you start working on them beginning gunsmiths, understand the interrelationships and what the geometry is. We've covered several different things here. I haven't shown you how to do a trigger job because if you've gotten there, you know a couple of things about gunsmithing that I'm just not going to talk about out here in the outside world. So whether or not um, your triggers are horizontal, vertical, if they're sliding, if they're rotating, no matter what they're doing, there are always three things they have in common. The part that you're holding back, the part you're holding it back with, and where they meet each other. Yeah, and that brings me to another thing about triggers. You know, a lot of people, they want to make that their trigger a lot slicker. Don't do that. You guys got to have some brains in today's world, all right? So whether or not your triggers are horizontal or vertical, it's been a pleasure.